There are three main ham radio bands, HF, VHF, and UHF. With UHF or ultra high frequency, the waves leave the antenna and bounce off buildings and around solid things, but they don't go around mountains. VHF or very high frequency waves can pass around some obstacles, but still can be blocked. These are mainly line of sight antennas. Think FM radio, which is why it doesn't work over the curve of the earth or behind a mountain. But that doesn't stop all radio. HF, high frequency waves, are my favorite when you talk about it in this way. Because starting about 50 kilometers above you is the ionosphere, an electrically charged layer of the atmosphere. Ham radios using the HF range can bounce those waves off the ionosphere, creating a sky wave. That wave skips to another point on the Earth or hits another antenna, which can rebroadcast it. All ham signals can be rebroadcast. Someone could pick it up and send it out again like a relay. I wasn't kidding when I said you could pick up CISO in Swaziland. But Swaziland isn't the furthest that radio can reach. In 1969, an operator in Louisville, Kentucky, picked up radio between Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon during Apollo 11. He even recorded President Nixon's message to them. You can still talk to astronauts with amateur ham radio today. The ionosphere doesn't bounce all signals. On the International Space Station, the crew has access to a ham radio. When they are overhead, their two-meter FM transceiver allows the ground to have a chat with space. You can see for yourself that the astronauts are overhead, talk to them while they're there, and then they'll fly away. Take that, conspiracy theorists. <laughs>
My name is Glenn Rutherford. I am a 66-year-old newspaper editor in Louisville, Kentucky. I was 23 years old in 1969 when my friend Larry Basinger came up with this notion. <laughs> I'm Larry Basinger, and I've been a ham radio operator some 55 or 60 years. Larry and I had been friends for a while. We'd sit around and talk and chat, and he got a liberal education in, in the art and, and the science of, of designing and building antennas from scratch. Early in the spring of 69, Larry, he said to me, I need to build a system that listens to the uh, backpack to backpack uh, radio signals from Armstrong and Aldrin when they're on the moon. I thought he was crazy. <laughs> But looking back on it, my goodness, we don't think there was anybody else who did it. This is Apollo Control at 102 hours, 12 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11. It's grown quite quiet here in Mission Control. 21 minutes, 23 seconds from the beginning of the powered descent to the lunar surface. In the back of our minds, I think uh, the whole project sort of hinged around what we will or will not hear that the general public won't, won't ever know. Yeah, the, the notion that we might be able to hear something that nobody else would hear was just intriguing as the Dickens to me. The antenna we used for the, the Moonwalk project was a six foot by six foot framework covered with chicken wire and that was perched on top of uh, an antenna rotor right in the center of my backyard, and we had a control box in the control room, so <laughs> it was necessary to, to visually verify where the thing was actually pointing. Neither one of us, until that night, had thought of, wait, we gotta make sure we see the moon. And it, <laughs> and it was cloudy, it was as cloudy as London. <laughs> it was British gray. <laughs> we panicked, to be very honest with you, you know, looking for the moon, pointing the, the antenna at various places in the sky. I mean, I remember looking at him and looking at the sky and thinking, oh, crap, what are we going to do? <laughs> There's a foot coming down. There he is. Yeah. There's a foot coming down the steps. At one point, we gave up, and we went in the other room and were watching. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. <laughs> out of a sense of disgust that Larry's dream wasn't going to come true, I, I went back into the antenna control and thought I heard something on the radio, and, uh, just some static, and went back in and said, Larry, you, I thought I heard something here. Do you want to come in and see? And lo and behold, there was Neil Armstrong's voice. Quality is not a word you would use to describe what we were hearing. It was No, but it was there. We were able to hear Nixon's voice coming out of Armstrong's earpiece. The moment that I realized this was working, uh, and I saw just how happy Larry was, that night, that event, that look in his eye, uh, that shared experience is really and truly one of the highlights of my life. I uh, essentially have so much glare coming onto my visor. I'm going to battle. I'll uh, helmet actually get battle, and then it takes a short while for my eyes to adapt. We were listening to a five watt radio signal from. 225,000 miles away. I mean, the fact that he was able to do that just it is astonishing to me. One of them stepped on a cable. You remember that? Yes, yes, that's he right. Said, watch your foot. Watch your foot. Watch your step. Yeah, watch your step. Watch it, Neil. You can feel you're on a cable. Okay. Yeah, lift up your right foot. Right foot. Uh, it's still, your toe is still hooked in it. That one? Yeah, it's still hooked in it. Okay, you're clear now. Thank you. Larry moved the antenna a time or two just to make sure uh, what we were getting was what we were getting from the moon, and it, and it was. 
When we're pointed at it with the antenna, we get the signal. If the moon moves out of the path of the antenna, the signal fades. And eventually, when the moon set, we lost the signal entirely. My wife and daughter were, were watching this whole thing occur on television, a, a couple of rooms removed from where we were. And when we finally got around to, to shouting to them that, that we had achieved this, I think the response was, yeah, we see it on TV. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> it's right here. <laughs>